Prior to the British Watch and Clockmakers exhibition in March, we are touching base with the great and the good of the watch industry. Today, we are lucky to have a very special guest. We have James Mulvale, who is, and I quote, the content and communications manager for Fairer Watches. But more importantly, <laughs> he's an old friend of Watch Gecko. James, how Hello. lovely to see you again. Nice to see you too, Richard. This is definitely a bit of deja vu going on. It's isn't a bit it? surreal, isn't it? Yes. Twilight yes. Zone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's good to be back. It's, it's great, good, isn't it? Good it's to lovely. See you again. It's lovely. It's so nice to have a guest in that I think this is going to be easy. Yes. Well. Mm. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> Moving no. on. It will be. It will be. No, it'll be good. Fear of watches. It is fairer. That's the correct Yes, fairer, not farer or yeah. kind of a fairer. as in wayfarer. Yes, exactly. Of. Yes, because it's yeah that or seafarer, farfarer, mm. all that mm. sort of things. It's obviously a segment of exploration. Been around since two thousand and fifteen. Mm -hmm. An enviable portfolio. But going straight in, was it a conscious effort to have conscious intention to have this huge portfolio, or is it just something that's evolved through time? Well, yeah, I think right from day dot, the brand has always sort of gone that extra mile when it comes to variations. You know, we don't like to just come up with a design uh, and essentially just do a few different colorways, you know, the obvious. You know, we're always going that extra mile to come up with different designs from scratch, right? So, you know, if you look at um, the vast majority of our collections, the dial layouts will be completely different with a completely different color palette, mm. right? And it's just, it just off offers more variation, obviously, you know. Because I made a note here, I actually counted when I was looking at the website, you had 17 families of watches. Mm. What do you, what, if you had to describe fairer DNA, I'm putting you on the spot here, yeah, I know, yes. what, what, would you, what would you say it was? Well, so the way I always sort of describe what the brand is all about is, is, what is, asking, is yeah. basically, you know, we like to take, you know, a complication of watch, you know, whether that's just a simple time only, uh, a GMT, a diver, and, and approach it in a way that sort of allows it to be reinvented. So we, we look at, you know, classic vintage pieces and we look at the elements incorporated and then we basically apply a very modern color palette and the latest, you know, production techniques to use textures, right? That you wouldn't have seen uh, back then, or you wouldn't see in the now in a lot of other places, a lot of other brands to come up with a watch that's very much a modern piece, right? We're not in the business of making vintage reissues, you know, or um, so the idea is that, yeah, it's, it's a very contemporary piece um, that that always looks to the future sort of thing. It's, it's a watch for today. And I think that's really, that that sums it up. You know, it's all about uh, exploring new ground um, aesthetically and, and just coming up with something different. It is quite difficult, yeah, because, I mean, we, we've been looking at some watches recently that we've been doing reviews of, mm. which are, they're old reissues of watches. Now, that's the, the kindest way I could describe them. Mm. And the companies are quite blatantly doing mm. that. Mm -hmm. And they, they've obviously seen something that's been successful in the past and yeah. they're running with it. I think what Fair have to be, dare I say, applauded for is that the fact that you've designed these watches, which, like the model you're wearing at the moment, yep. it's it looks like it should be a vintage watch. It's clearly a very contemporary modern watch, mm. and you've somehow spliced the two design concepts together. Yeah, which. I can imagine it's not easy. Do you, when you're going through the design process, I'm sure, does somebody look at it and say, it's too vintage or it's too contemporary? Is there like a balance, a fine balancing act you're constantly sort of seeking? Oh, it, it's definitely a very fine line, right, as to, you know, coming up with something that's conventional enough that people don't go, that looks odd. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, obviously coming up with something that, that's unique and different and special. Yeah, I mean, this is really why texture and colour at the core of the brand right because that is how we achieve that contemporary look mm. you know like I say, a lot of the elements on there on our watches are quite traditional in a lot of ways but it's it's in the detail of how we've chosen to execute them um, that makes a watch special you know you look at a lot of our pieces and we use um, Lumicast so it's super luminova blended with ceramic for the numerals Okay. So, you know, on, on paper, if you saw a black and white drawing, you go, well, that's just uh, an Arabic or a Roman numeral. 
but in real life, obviously, it's a three-dimensional block that glows, right? And often on models like the Resolute uh, or this, the Palmer GMT, we've overprinted that block with um, a colored paint so that you get the high contrast of, you know, the in this case, like uh, black on on a pearlescent dial, yeah. but then the luminescence in the dark glows from behind it, so it gives a an unusual backlit effect that I don't think anyone else has done. So that's probably the best example, really, of taking, like I say, that classic yeah, element sure. and just reinventing it in, in something that's unique. It's also showing an exceptional attention to detail. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, I, I won't lie, to anybody here this is when you brought the box in today it's really the first proper hands-on i've had other than a couple of the 36 mil you sent mm. through for us to yeah. review um what i wasn't prepared for when i looked at them was the level of attention to detail uh and i don't think you can really fully appreciate that until you really get them in your hands mm. you were talking about texture mm. uh, and nothing i think typifies that probably greater than the case of the moon phase yeah the moon phase is a great one to talk about it and and I think you're right, like the devil is in the details, you know, to coin that uh, mm. famous expression. Um, so you're right. So the case um, on the moon phase, the sides have this knurled pattern that um, for us was inspired by a uh, vintage sort of 1920s Dunhill lighter. So obviously they have knurling on for grip mm. and for striking. Um, so that's what inspired that. Um, but then also, uh, as you're talking about texture, for us a key thing is each moon phase disc um, the the moons which are luminescent, um, they've all been hand painted and then they're they're sort of micro burnt into the surface to again give a a texture. So we haven't just um, printed it on mass sort of thing. Um, it's it literally is a hand made process wow. where an individual dial maker in Switzerland is is burning painting each the loom onto each disc and then burning. The, the moon to give it a, a unique and very subtle texture that you won't see anywhere else. But you know, the effect is obviously that it it looks a lot more artisanal or is a lot more artisanal than you know a traditional moon phase where it's obviously just a printed printed picture. And that will be even more apparent, I assume, when the loom is yes, active. yes. Yeah. So I mean, I can whip out the old black light but you know it really does well, yeah no no i can see it quite clearly yeah yeah so looking specifically at some of the beautiful watches we've mm -hmm. got here at the moment let's start with the one that i swiped <laughs> yes, early on it's a very you piece it is, is, is well I, I swiped it this is the endeavor in yes. titanium mm -hmm. this is obviously a dedicated dive watch mm -hmm. it is a super compressor which we can part of our aqua compressor collection part of your aqua right we're going to explore that in a minute okay I mean, what may not be obvious to anybody looking at this in the close-up, which will inevitably be floating up here now, is the fact that the watch is made of titanium. Yeah. Because it looks like it's made of stainless steel. Mm. And as a titanium Seamaster owner mm. who, who can vouch for the fact that his watch is a flat, dull, grey colour, mm. this is very impressive. How do they do this with titanium? <laughs> well, I think it's just a case of... Um, as you know, technology in machining has progressed. You know, we're very fortunate in that machining has got to this stage where it is able to work titanium like it can work steel. Yeah. Right? You know, whereas 20, 30 years ago that was sort of uh, not really possible. These days we are able to finish it to uh, in the same style, I should say. Well, if you look back on old adverts from IC Master, which yeah. is about 1999, they, they were actually trumpeting the fact that it's difficult to work with. Well, yes, which it still is, of course. Yeah, of you know, course it's, yeah. <laughs> it's not changed. It's just that the machinery just, just technologies, it. yeah, gotten yeah. better. Yeah. Um, and obviously, the, you know, the benefits of titanium yeah. are speak for themselves. I'm sure we're all familiar with, you know, lightweight, super corrosion yeah. resistant, etc. Ideal for a dive watch. Oh, it is. I mean, it's the hypoallergenic qualities. Everything about it is perfect mm. for a dive watch because you get. Also, you get, I mean, it's, what, six times stronger than steel? Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, something like that. Which means that I have got a watch that is remarkably slim. Mm. Mm. This, yeah. does, this does not feel like it should be a 300-meter watch because it's light, it's thin. Um, so tell me about the Aqua slash Super Compressor well, so, so concept. To explain it, right, so obviously, stylistically, it is based on the classic Epsa Super Compressors, which 
you know, dual crown divers with an internal bezel, which one of the crowns operates. The difference is, so traditionally a super compressor, as the name suggests, as you know, mm -hmm. um, the deeper you go, the higher the water pressure and the more that compresses the gaskets around the watch to increase the water resistance. So we have replicated that um, for our crowns. So they are uh, accurate compressor crowns. Now the reason it fell out of favour as a, as a style of uh, achieving water resistance is that there is a limit to how far down you can really go with a true super compressor, you know, where the case back is also compressed. So ours uses just the traditional screw down case back, mm -hmm. which just, you know, again, it's modern technology, yeah. right, compared to that 60s stuff. So yeah. that's why we can achieve the 300 meters water resistance. So it's sort of a blend of the old and the new in that regards. But again, it's, you know, it's not just a gimmick, as you say, for the sake of, oh, look, it's a super compressor. No, 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 we, we've set out to make an uncompromising dive watch that's more than capable of, of you know, going down to the depths required, um, which is why you've got that blend of the old and the new. But... It looks great. It looks great. And the nice bit is, you know, having, as, as we are lucky enough to do, reviewed just about every dive watch that came out this year, this is by far one of the most unusual. Mm. Tell you the thing that really struck me with it, it's an aesthetic thing, which mm -hmm. I really like, is that when I'm looking at it straight on, the crystal, the dial is front and center. It's not dominated by the case. Um, when you look at some of the Swiss giants, which you and I both know so well and indeed own, uh, there is a lot of case there. Yeah. There's a massive, great big bezel there staring you in the face. This is, it's like you've given the whole watch over to the dial, which somehow gives it this enormous sense of legibility. Yeah, which is obviously, you know, that is the key yeah. thing, isn't it? Parameter for a diver. So it's it's, it's certainly front and yeah, centre for it. Absolutely, yeah. What movement is in it? Just because so, people can't see it maybe from here? So this is the Salita SW200. Uh, we use the Elabore grade version with a bit of custom decoration mm -hmm. on the rotor, as you can see, uh, adjusted in three positions. And I'm sure many of the people watching this will know just how you know reliable yeah. and ubiquitous the SW200 is. You know, it is... Uh, Hate to use the term, but a workhorse movement. It's you know, no, known. it's true. It it's is. it's reliable, yeah. accurate, easy to repair. You know, it just makes sense, mm. doesn't it? I'm going to ask you later about the Britishness of watches, <laughs> and so think about that really, yeah. because I think there is a Britishness to mm -hmm. a lot of this. Mm -hmm. But we'll work out what the heck exactly what that means is. Yeah, yeah. As, as we evolve the conversation, Chrono Contempo. So that'd be these two. Here. Yeah, yeah. Now, first thing that strikes me is the size, thirty-eight point five mil. Mm -hmm. Um, I think as I made a, uh, an observation in my notes here, were that a Speedmaster, it would be called reduced. Yeah. But you're obviously treating this as a Standalone. standard size. Yeah, I, I mean, for us, you know, ergonomics are one of the core pillars when we're designing any model of watch. You know, it's got to wear well. And um, we find, obviously, this nice compact 38 and a half mil case um, just allows for that, you know, for it to sit very nicely on most wrists. And... As I've touched on previously, you know, our watches are for everyone. Um, yeah. You know, uh, no matter who you are, you know, your your gender or or, or you know, anything like that, it's for anyone who yeah. likes them to wear. So, you know, bearing that in mind, um, you know, it's not that it really affects, you know, yeah. the size we do, but, you know, it just helps. It's just a good mid midpoint size for us. Yeah, no, it's interesting. No, I think I think you, we we can we can touch on that again. I mean, it's it's there's there's no question in the industry today. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a move away from the quote men's ladies yeah. unquote. Yeah, gendering watches. Yeah, it, 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 I was talking to somebody very senior in the auction industry the other mm -hmm. day who was saying their whole philosophy has changed. Yeah. I personally believe this is giving watchmakers a lot more freedom. Yeah, because. You know, you may well be a guy who wants to rock a 34.5 millimeter salmon dial watch mm. where previously you felt maybe you couldn't for mm. whatever reason. Mm. And equally, uh, ladies may want to wear a 42 mil, whatever they want. But yeah. it, it was qu quite prescribed yeah. before. Yeah, yeah. So I see this is a real evolution, I think. Yeah, of course. And, you know, th this is, again, this is what, what we're all about, you know, sort of our... our the second word, you know, printed on these contempos right underneath Farah is universal. 
right? Because that's what we consider ourselves to be. We design watches that are very deliberately, you know, we don't gender our models because they're just for whoever likes them to wear. You know, yeah, it doesn't matter who you are. If you, you know, if you are a woman that wants to wear one of our larger chrono sports, that's fine. If you're a gentleman that wants to wear a 36 millimeter pink dial blander, that's equally good. You rock what you want. You know, that, that's the that's, message we're trying to spend. Send. Is that your sales line? You rock what you want. You rock what you want. If it yeah. isn't, it should be. <laughs> yeah. This is beautiful. This this is, this, correct, is this, this has got a nickname, this one, isn't the one I've got here. Oh, so, so this is um, a big eye layout. That's the big eye. Where that's the, what it was, um, yeah. chronograph second subdial is deliberately enlarged for legibility. Right, okay. And this, again, is typifying as well. the You've gone for the functionality of having the chrono hand in bright orange, which mm -hmm. makes sense because that's to appeal to the tool watch <laughs> geeks like myself. Yeah. But you're also embracing the color palettes. Mm -hmm. Now, I just wanted to touch on the color palettes generally mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. your brands, um, which I thought was typified by your lovely use of the word um, chalcot. Yes, uh, which is that very famous row of houses, yes, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Uh, which exactly. we can maybe flash a photo up of. Yeah, yeah. One of our authors, Charlotte's, done some very interesting uh, writing on the colour choices. Mm. And I'd just be curious to have another brand's take on it because we've noticed that um, some of the larger, more common brands mm. are now really embracing this pastel colours. Yeah. Only, I think I said to you off camera, only this weekend I was looking at the Breitling Boutique of my wife yeah. who was looking at Navi timers in pastel pink and mm. blue. And, and so it, it's clearly something that's been embraced now. Mm -hmm. How, what, what's, what's Farah's take on the, the colour palette trend? <sighs> well, we feel like, I guess, we've, we're a bit ahead of the curve. You, know, well, we've been, you been might doing, well have been, actually. I've yeah. <laughs> been doing it since day dot, really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, so for us, yeah, it's just, like I say, it's just a way of uh, expressing, giving a fresh take, you know, to a lot of these genres of watches. And um, also it's allowing wearers to, you know, express their style, right? Because, you know, for some people, their favorite color might be mint green, it might be orange. It just allows a much more, a much greater level of individuality yeah. than you'd get from, as you say, your, your sort of traditional bog standard stuff, which is generally, you know, what, um, black, blue, or silver and white, you know, that, yeah, that sort of thing. Sure. And we obviously, we offer, you know, like the Endeavour, we offer black dialed watches for those who want that. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, whichever way you fall, fall whether you like color or you prefer monochrome. Um, we offer something for everyone. But, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about choice and and just helping that, you know, a person's individuality yeah. to... I mean, I think when, we're, when we've been talking about the uh, fairer DNA, I mean, I can see it very much, for example, in this model here, mm. where you've gone for what is a classically dark dial with the yeah. legibility, but you've brought the DNA out in the bezel. Yeah, you know, what, the color. why do, you know, what everyone else is doing. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, we've developed that specific orange ceramic bezel, uh, which we nickname uh, Orangina, because um, it looks just like the orange soda, right? Um, <laughs> I hadn't picked up on that no, one either. Exactly. But, you know, that was uh, a specific color we developed with the manufacturer. You know, we went through several prototypes, yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to get the shade just right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, like you say, it just, it lifts it up, yeah. gives it a pop. What is really interesting on this, especially aesthetically on this one, because you have, dare I say quite cleverly, managed to get the dial and strap the same colour. <laughs> yes, again. So you've just, you've got this through line of colour with the, you know, again, it's functional to a watch, does everything you would need it to do as a chronograph. But that's the details again, yeah. you see, it's thinking, okay, well, if we have... Um, you know, a, a waffle dial or a waffle strap, you know, let's blend the two. Yeah, just so, sure. yeah, as you say, you get that seamless integration yeah. of case and Beautifully dial. finished off movement as well. Thank you, and thank it you. really is, again, you've, I mean, you've obviously gone to the trouble of having it branded. Well, we... But the, the, the engraving on it is superb. So we always take particular care with our movement decoration, yeah. um, especially when, obviously, we use display case backs on a lot of our watches. And we believe that if you do that, you know, there's no point in doing it and just having a bog standard movement, right? So <laughs> we, we go that extra mile to ensure Absolutely. that you've got those custom, that custom bridge work, you know, which there has a uh, sort of a tessellated logo of the, um, the arrow 
across it you know we blew the screws we get um and the tiny suggestion of bronze on the crown which i picked up on yes again that's something of a signature when the company first started of course um often uh, nearly all the watches if not all had bronze crowns and as time's gone on we've uh, moved into a steel crown with a bronze cap inset into it yeah um which again it's just a subtle detail yeah that, it is. that you know side on obviously you can see it but you know when the watch is on your wrist it doesn't immediately stand out and again it's just, it's just a little different thing that you know most people obviously just engrave the crown and oh, no, that's fine yeah. but you know it, it's just doing things a little bit differently for us yeah absolutely yeah looking at um a watch I've, and i'll quote what i've actually written down here Feels like it's been designed without compromise. The lander, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's I, 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 even as somebody who writes professionally in the watch industry, that's it's a heck of a sweeping statement. statement. It is, isn't it? You know, it's one that could trip me up mm. in years to come. But I genuinely felt it. It's the only one of the watches that I have taken a long time to review, <laughs> which was the very first one you sent through. Mm. But it really did feel like a field watch for twenty twenty three. If that makes sense, yeah. If, if it was a, it was a watch design without compromise. It gave me everything I wanted from mm. a field outdoor GMT travelers yeah. type watch, mm. but it just had contemporary twists on it, which I hadn't really seen anywhere else. Yeah, of course. Um, and it's funny, you, like you, you reference it as a field watch because it's not necessarily something we we think of it as or market it as. I oh, see. That's uh, very much the vibe. But, it gave but to I, me. I get why yeah. because obviously we do have our full the full Arabic numeral dial, um, the syringe handset. So it does have that highly legible. Yeah. Which again, it's, it's key to everyday uh, and, and, functionality. And, a, and as, as you well know, <laughs> a field watch can mean different things to different well, people. Well, of course. But I think back in the day, you and I maybe even crafted a feature about what is a field watch yeah. is is a submariner a field watch because you wear it every day out exploring. yeah exactly you know? i know what you mean yeah if it's but, fit for purpose. but, but, but there are certain design specifications people mm. would would look for in a classic field watch and whether it was meant to or not that ticked all the boxes for me yeah and i think i think it's sort of a happy coincidence really because in many ways for us this is sort of just your perfect um, everyday traveler's watch, right? It's yeah. a watch you can uh, journey with you, you know, if you're traveling abroad to other continents and obviously use the GMT function to track a second time zone. But equally, it's legible and discreet and easy to wear. And it's obviously just a watch that you can have on your wrist 24 seven all year round. And, you know, it it'll do the job. It, it's going to excel and, and be with you every step of the way. You know, we yeah. haven't compromised. We thoroughly enjoyed putting it on different straps. Not that there's anything wrong with the, the bracelet no, that no. it comes on, but you know what our ilk is like. Well, yeah. And, and it, 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 was a, it was, to quote a term, a strap monster. It, was, it, it looked great on leather. It looked great on the 1973 military nylons. It looked great on uh, rubber. It, it just chewed them up. Yeah, so so as you know, uh, on our site we offer um, with all our watches um, a drop down where you can select yeah. um, a variety of straps from us. I think when you you sent it through on leather, didn't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. But yeah, you're 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 exactly right. This this is one of the watches that probably has the some of the most uh, the biggest variety of options because, as you say, you know the color pairs so well with everything from you know a standard navy blue to this mm. sort of petrol uh, you can go orange yeah. i think actually it's funny our two biggest sellers of strap for this is people either get it on a tan mm -hmm. or they get it on a, a orange leather strap i could I, yeah, <laughs> so no, it's, I it's, it. it's funny you're either it. very traditional sort yeah. of thing or or you're completely yeah, out there completely, yeah. making a bit of a statement and pairing it with yeah. the second hand 36 mil a conscious decision yes uh, very much so simply we feel it's it's some a trend in the industry that you know is 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 a very good one is offering you know popular watches in multiple sizes because you know obviously it's, everyone's got their own individual preference right regardless of you know wrist size as well um, some people like smaller watches some people like larger um, and you know there's nothing wrong with either um, so we wanted to just open up our options yeah. and in fact it's the first time we've ever taken a, a watch model and created a collection that's just different colorways of the same dial design so obviously we've launched with 
the standard Lambda color in 36 mil. And then we also did the uh, sort of um, mint seafoam green uh, sea coast, and then the pink Kano. I'm going to come to your naming strategy after we've talked about the last one. Okay. <laughs> because I'm conscious of the fact we're bouncing names around here. And yeah. Anybody who's listening to this and still with us mm. will be thinking, these are some really unusual names because... For example, Lander, people are saying, what, what does Lander mean? So mm. we'll come to that in a bit. We had such a vast array of watches to look mm. at, but we had to just pick a few. Um, Moonface. This is where we were talking about your naming strategy. Mm. Maybe this is a good segue into okay. it. Okay. Because you've got Eddington, for yep. example. You've got Halley. Yep. You've, you, you've got wonderfully evocative names. Um, tell us about the watch first, then we'll look at the names. So, yes, yeah, so the moon phase um, is obviously a an evolution of our best-selling cushion case collection, um, which is you know, time only with a sub-second style. We were obviously thinking of how we can expand expand it, um, and the moon phase is the oldest complication in watchmaking, and people have been using the lunar cycle to, you know, measure the elapse of time and the seasons uh, since prehistory. Yeah. Um, so it made sense for us to do do a moon phase watch. Um, but of course, you know, being us, we don't like to do it um, in a way that's been done before. You know, we're trying to think outside the box. And that obviously, you know, being us meant a use of colour. And so we've basically you know, tried to, or given this range, a very contemporary uh, aesthetic with the dial the again the use of color and texture yeah. um you know so for example is it a sunburst dial um yes on that it one does, so, so again yeah. they've each got different dials so so that's got um a, a light blue sunburst yeah. on the burbage there the eddington has a vertically brushed pink copper dial right um and then the haley has a deep uh, glossy blue, uh, midnight blue dial with a slight gradient to the colour that gets slightly darker at the edge of the dial. Right. Very, almost imperceptible, but it is there. The idea was to make it very contemporary, so that meant, you know, using, again, Lumicast blocks of, of numerals, exceptionally thin, very tricky to do Lumicast that thin, because obviously it can yeah. get quite fragile, and very contemporary numerals, so especially on the Eddington here, we use obviously Roman numerals, but they're sans serif, just to make bring them up to date. You know, make them modern because um, we don't want them to be stuffy and traditional and old fashioned. But on top of that is the moon phase themselves. They're all hand painted these um, to give them sort of an artisanal flair. So is all... that how the texturing on the moon is done? Because I, I mean, it, it the moon genuinely looks three D. Yes. So so for us, and this is why these take us a very long time to produce comparative to other models because each moon phase disc is hand painted in Switzerland and then the moons are all loomed and then what the uh, ma maker does is they they micro burn sort of a texture onto the surface of that that loomed moon to to bring it to life right and, and give it a, a very unique and individual look that sort of just gives it that subtle three-dimensional mm. effect it's not just a printed block of colour and that's it, because that, that looked quite flat and dull. These micro abrasions just give it that, that real texture and, and three-dimensional effect. And, and like I say, they're all looms. They all... It's got a fantastic loom pattern, which inevitably we, we will be showing over our voices at the moment. I mean, yeah. having looked at them under UV light, it is innovative. It's, it's stylistically interesting because, as you said, they're all different. Yeah. You could own three of these moon phase watches and you have to all intents and purposes three different watches. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, which is, it's almost throughout a whole range, right? That That is one of the things we like to do is, you know, each collection is very distinct yeah. because it, it, it allows you to obviously look at each watch and each collection with fresh eyes and you're not thinking, oh, it's just like, you know, their previous collection, but with yeah. a GMT hand or, or a moon phase complication. You know, the, these aren't just our, our cushion cases with a, a moon phase slapped on. You know, it's a complete redesign of, of everything, really. Um, even the case, as we've mentioned, you know, is, is textured on the sides. So they're unique cases for this range. I mean, I think that the price point is is very good for what you're getting, because you're getting, to all intents and purposes, an individually crafted mm. watch. 
that, a, that a, an artisan has worked on. Yeah. And I certainly, until I entered the watch industry, did not appreciate how much time it takes to design yeah. a watch. Exactly. Yeah. How much effort goes into it? It sounds naive, perhaps. <laughs> no, I, I know what you but, mean. But I didn't. Because there's all sorts I saw of things you don't hand. think about. And, you know, vis-a-vis -vis sort of the time and the cost, um, here's a quick little sort of behind-the-scenes peek on these as to, you know, how some of the costs change between these and our, our time-only cushion cases. For example, the, the te that texturing, mm. that uh, I believe it added around 65% increase in the cost of the case. Just adding that on each side wow. has, yeah, given that sort of level of increase to the cost of manufacturing the cases. And as to the movements, including that moon phase uh, disc, having the moon phase module over the time only ones in our cushion cases uh, doubles the cost of the movement. Yeah, and so, time as well. Well, exactly. You know, we release these, um, you know, start of the year, um, you know, only a couple of months in. And they've sold out very quickly. Uh, we had a second drop uh, later in the year, and again they've gone. And we are bringing these back. The plan at the time of recording is to bring these back uh, around March. Okay. Um, oh, just in time for the show. Yes, exactly. Um, and you know, it's taken us so long, despite the the very popular demand, because. Obviously, it takes time to do yeah. that, that artisanal side of it and that, that get there, that right. I never forget there was a particular brand that you and I used to work closely with back in the day. Mm. I won't say it, but it was, um, and they had a bezel that was in that that, that, that was uh, that it had been cut around the numbers rather than the numbers being engraved in. Mm. And I remember talking to the manufacturer and them saying it takes a full sixty minutes oh, yeah. to make each bezel. I, as a watch enthusiast, I appreciate that I, that to me is that's not that's again it's what we've said earlier it's not yeah. somebody compromising and i think that's the key i would if i could get a message across to people watching this just now it's this wonderful feeling of things not being designed by compromise which with, with yeah. compromise which is is quite rare in today's world and i think and i think also in today's world of you know modern machinery right everyone assumes that you know, it's really easy and yeah. it doesn't take much time to, for stuff to be bashed out on a CNC machine or a press or whatever yeah. it is. But actually, yeah, there's still quite a lot that, that takes that time and that attention. And, you know, obviously yeah. when, when prototyping and you watch things go wrong, things, of course. things don't quite come out and you've got to, you've got to do some iterations yeah. to get that right. So Absolutely. it's still very much a, a very time consuming mm -hmm. process that requires a lot of effort as well yeah. to, to get things you know exactly how you want um be that color or or texture or just just features you know and as you well know something we did often share in common was um with watches it's all about the story yes a watch without a st as, as somebody very very senior in the watch industry said to me yeah. just the other day mm. uh, and a watch without a story is just a watch yeah. and that that spoke to me volumes mm. and you have got really evocative names for all of your collections mm -hmm. be it lander who was a very famous explorer that mm -hmm. people can go and reference mm -hmm. the astronomical connections with the names yeah. endeavor one assumes is named after a particularly famous ship yep uh, which again people can research if they want uh this is this is really to me, it's very evocative. The name of a watch, it, it 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 kind of sucks you down the passage of where the creator is going. Yeah. How do you do? Do you come up with a a name and think, can we design a watch around it, or do you come up with a watch and think, what name could we have to suit it? Basically, I think it really depends on on the watch as to which way that happens, right? And and what the inspiration is, because yeah. sometimes you see something where a certain color or texture or aesthetic inspires you, and you're like, okay, yeah, hey, let's incorporate that. Yeah. And then, but then things like to use the Moon Phase collection as an example. Obviously, we set out first being like, let's do a Moon Phase, and then obviously you're thinking, well, what do we call them? Because yeah. obviously we've got this convention uh, of of what we call our watches um and so that seemed the the obvious thing would be to name after astronomers uh, and some of the lesser known ones which is so nice 
Yeah, I mean, I think Haley is probably the most known because yeah. everyone knows Haley's Comet. Um, but yeah, of course, the other two, it's trying to, uh, yeah, shine a, a bit of a light on um, just those who are obviously deserving of recognition. I won't lie, I had to look one up <laughs> and I thought, I don't know what that is. But then you read the guy's story and you think, yeah. wow, what a inspirational person to name a watch that one can't help but feel he would have approved of. Well, we'd like to, like to think so. Yeah. Yeah. Like I say, you like to tie the, tie the story in and, you know, it fits the theme of the watch. Um, you know, you're not going to call it after a race car driver. Like <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you can tell us that might be next for Fira? Well, so, um, yeah, as always with us, we've got a lot going on. And immediately after this video should go live in early January, uh, we've got a restock of the Endeavour and then two new aqua compressors coming out um, in two new colorways not seen before. So if you've been following the collection for a while and you're a fan, you know, th these are going to be brand new stuff you've never seen. Um, so excited for that. And then afterwards, we will have a return of the long-awaited World Timers. Again, another very popular collection for us, and they've been updated, reinvented slightly, um, just to build on the original and, and hopefully give, give those fans of it more what they love. And then after that, we will have a restock of the Moon Phase um, with one additional dial color planned that's very special and different. Um, and I, I, I can't give away anymore. And you can't tell me the I, name. I can't even tell you the name, but it is completely different color. Wow. And um, just, wow. It, it's very different to these three here, which will also be returning. But yeah, we've got a very okay. special, special one coming as well. No. As we said right at the beginning, mm -hmm. the main reason that we're chatting today, apart from to look at the wonderful watches, mm -hmm. is that we're both going to the big show in March, yep. the Watch and Clockmaker show, which is their first big mm -hmm. gathering. I'm not asking Farah now, I'm asking mm. James. Okay. What do you? What is British watchmaking to you? What, what do you see? You can answer it from corporately or personally. No, no, of course. Um, I mean, it's funny, I was uh, asked this question at a show in in September and I think in in some ways it kind of echoes what I consider and what I've talked about as fair as core values in that fundamentally it's it's generally a, a, an attention to detail and also a desire to do things in a different and unique way to, to greater and lesser degrees because obviously there are lots of great British brands that in many ways are very traditional, especially compared to us, and I'm not knocking that. Yeah. But uh, my point is that there's people who are doing things differently in in a very subtle way, but one that still produces very unique products. Um, and I think that really is is the defining thing about British watchmaking. It's you know whatever your brand or your style and your aesthetic, it's it's just applying the details in in a way that creates something very new and unique. Like I say, even if on the face of it, you know, it's it's not a, a brightly coloured watch or whatever, or it might be a very traditional looking yeah. watch, but it's just done in a way that you won't you won't see anyone else yeah. in in other parts of the world do, right? I I genuinely believe I, I said this to um alistair audsley who we interviewed um last week mm -hmm. i think you can recognize a british watch uh, a bit of a sweeping statement i know but i do think you can same way i think you can recognize an italian watch or an american watch mm. there is a certain look yeah and i think the british watch industry is finding that look Probably typified yeah. by people like yourself or by Marlow yeah. or, or even or, or many other brands yeah, as well. Yeah, there yeah. is a Britishness about them. I'm not saying there's any commonality in no, design. No, no, I, I, I know, yeah, yeah. But the, people are definitely coming at it from a common intention. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, to expand on what I said also, there's all um, a certain refinement to all these, all us that, British that's brands, is Yeah, that's a good you word. Know, yeah. we're, there's all a certain refinement to that aesthetic, whatever each brand's aesthetic is, that is very distinct. And as you say, it is, I like to think, very recognisable. Um, I think it is now, yeah. I probably wouldn't have said that 20 years ago. Well, there wasn't really much of a well, British watch industry. For very good reason. Even five, ten years ago. Yeah. Ten years ago. Yeah, no, so, you're right. You know, yeah, because yeah, since then, there's so many of us. But it's definitely something that's evolving into something. It's, it's, it's been fascinating to watch the British journey yeah. 
evolve into what yeah. it is now. I mean, now they're you're looking at some of the smaller brands and thinking, gosh, that, that really is recognisable as a British watch. Yeah. Hence the reason we're going to have a show in March. <laughs> yeah, that celebrates. With a whole bunch of people around there. Which, yeah, exactly. You're right. We couldn't have done that 10 years ago. No, and it's funny because, yeah, by then I was getting into watches and there was, there was really nothing yeah. at all. And now, you know, we, here we are, you know, nearly 10 years on and you think of all the great stuff that's been made. It's basically. a real golden period, isn't it? Yeah, it, it really is. Where do you see this evolution going? Where would you like to see it going? Uh, so this is generally, I guess you're referring sort of thing to uh, domestic watch manufacture, aren't you, mm. in terms of British? Well, and also, you know, say that there's a, there's a kickback against Kosk. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. people are saying, oh, Kosk. Yeah. I'm not interested in that. Sort of thing. I mm. mean, could there be... British technical standards is also what I was thinking. I'm trying to think, where, where would this, this yes. where's this mushrooming into? Well, that's certainly the thing. I mean, so the bottom line, again, when, when I've been asked this question before, the bottom line I've always said is it doesn't necessarily matter where a watch is made. What matters is that the customer is getting a well-made, well-designed watch at a reasonable price. Of course, that's that, that I believe is the be-all end all you know um and it's great if we can bring more manufacturing over here um you know obviously certain other brands are, are doing it um but obviously at the moment i think the cost is just exponentially way too high yeah. and and personally i don't know if it's it's feasible really in terms of what the you know the end product will be delivered for the consumer you know, I, I don't know how feasible it is really uh, at the moment, but we'll, we'll see, you know, in 10 years yeah. it might be different. But in terms of technical specification, I definitely think we're certainly seeing more brands uh, assemble stuff in Britain. Mm. Um, certainly, you know, a lot of us were all doing QC and testing in Britain. Um, so, yeah, stuff, you know, talking about COSC and, and, you know, all that sort of chronometer certification stuff, I think that's probably a lot more plausible um, that could certainly happen in the near future is that we do develop, you know, a certain British standard, mm. right, of, of how accurate a watch needs to be. Because I'm sure, you know, we, for example, we, we, you know, we do a lot of testing in QC before we send a watch out. You know, it, it all gets inspected and put on a time graph. And, you know, that's in addition to obviously being adjusted and regulated yeah. anyway to be as accurate as possible, um, you know, even though these aren't, chronometer uh, certified movements, you know, we, we do, you know, regulate them to be accurate. So I think the logical next step might be for these brands, you know, as a collective for us to, yeah. to go down that route. But, you know, who, who can say? Um, all I can say is, you know, what matters, in my opinion, is is that we put the consumer first and, and just deliver them a good product, Amen. you know? <laughs> well... What can I say? Thank you so much for coming in, James. It's been a it's pleasure. Been fab to meet oh, up again. Been, yeah, it's been great to be back. Somewhat surreal. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's been, been wonderful. Fun. A bit it's of a time warp moment, but it's, yeah, 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 it's, no, been, it's great. been great. Thank you for bringing in the watches. Thank you for having me. Um, we'd love to be able to review the new models as and when they come out. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, love to be able to chat again if you're happy to always, come in. Always happy. I think we can possibly get together if the audience haven't switched off yet. They might want to do another one. <laughs> I make no promises. It could be a disaster. <laughs> We can live with that. Thanks very much for tuning in to the Watch Gecko YouTube channel again. Uh, we have lots more content coming up prior to the exhibition in March. So we'll be visiting other companies where we'll be getting some great insights into the watches they're designing. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you very much for joining us. If we had a tricorder, we would be getting strong chronoton particle readings. <laughs>